Jeff can't make it today. No problem, no problem. And Je Joey, you're on mute, so can I hear a vocal, verbal, yeah. Hi, um, yeah, I'm recording okay. right now. Oh, uh, you want me to like recording later? Um, no, you can, you can, I would hold off for a couple minutes okay. until, um, you know, we're all chit chatting and stuff like that. And I'll make an announcement about the quantum machine learning um, when we get rolling. But I think I'll wait. What time is it? It is 105. So we just give people a couple more minutes and me a chance to uh, get set up here. My two windows, my PowerPoint presentation. I have my video on, right? Oh, no, sorry. Hi, hi folks. <laughs> All right, so I think I'm ready to do this. All right, so Joey, are you ready? You can um, start if you want, and I will go into screen sharing, application sharing. No, I'll share the screen. All right, can you guys see my screen with my PowerPoint presentation? Yes. yes. All right, and some people need to be admitted. All right, and Joey, we're recording. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to um, week six of our HPC user training. I, I'm going to talk today about uh, MPI. So if you think about it, what we've done is uh, we started with um, acceleration, what they call acceleration, but now a lot of projects just start with a GPU application or an OpenMP where they take advantage of the, the parallelism built into threaded environments like a GPU and OpenMP. And um, also you could just do it with pthreads, but you get some acceleration with your problem when it's running on one node, right? Or on your laptop. But at some point, if you're in the world of high performance computing, which is the focus of what we do at SDSC, you, you need to maybe you're using up all the memory on your laptop. So your machine learning application is taking hours to finish because the data is getting so big or the complexity of whatever you're trying to train, the data set is too big. Most data sets are not big enough to bring on your laptop without additional terabytes of storage. But at some point, your local resource is not big enough. And, and that's where the role of message passing comes in. It used to be that message passing, which is just passing a packet of information on the network. In fact, you're looking at me via Zoom and how are you getting data? Some messages are being exchanged between your Zoom app or your web browser connection and the server at UCSD or whoever's hosting our Zoom services and my input where my presentation's coming from, my laptop. So there's messages going all around. The MPI is a, a particular communication protocol that was developed by a standards group, which is optimized for high performance computing. So they optimize the messages being passed around. They optimize the network they optimize uh, the hardware all to, to be tweaked and tuned to the requirements of high performance computing. So today we'll do a very broad overview of the basics of MPI. And someday as your applications grow and you grow into maybe developing, you're, you're gonna need maybe something more advanced. And there are tutorials online and classes you can take or you may evolve to using just an, an application and that's good enough. Like we have PyTorch and, and um, TensorFlow. And we have uh, for machine learning, we have all these applications, Amber, Gauss, all kinds of applications and libraries that you can be using as well. So the point of the training series is to give you guys some awareness of high performance computing, a few basic skills so you'll, you'll know enough about how, how the challenges are, what the challenges are, and, and what direction you may want to go. As a student, do you want to go into parallel computing, high performance computing, uh, or can you avoid it as a research scientist or in employment? Can you avoid it? I'm going to say mostly for most people, it's the latter. I love parallel computing. I love all the challenges and the games and the toys that we get to work with, but 
a good fraction of the people that end up working on high performance computing resources, which also include cyber infrastructure distributed resources, it's because they have to. And that makes it painful. So the other uh, reason for having this training is to reduce the pain or at least let you know, oh, this is getting hard. I should really ask an expert because it is challenging. Okay, so we've talked GPU, we've talked OpenMP, and now we talk about MPI. It originally was the main par parallel programming, programming environment when a computer, a cluster consisted of a lot of independent nodes, and they would have dare I say, one CPU on each node. And then, you know, you had to connect them, interconnect them with boxes, uh, the workstation boxes with some kind of cabling. Then they learned to per put multiple CPUs on a chip. And then you started having nodes with NUMA, non-uniform memory architecture. And so it got a little more complex, but each of the nodes could um, um, handle more and more data. And now we're in the age of data. We have thousands of cores on Expanse and you know, 128 cores per node. We have thousands of nodes on Expanse, a couple thousand and, and hundreds of 128 cores per node. So it's very complicated. There's a lot more capability. There are large memory nodes. And so depending on your application and where you're going, you may need to um, try to fit your whole application onto one GPU device onto several GPU devices on your, your node or onto multiple nodes. And um, ocean modeling, weather modeling, climate, those tend to be very, very, very large data. And as is like astrophysics, and there's some fields that are anything with fluids where you give the, them more memory and more compute resources, and they'll just go to smaller volumes, right? Large global weather models tend to be kilometer cells you know, one, one or two or five kilometers or 10. And that's a, a, a valid working model. But if you needed to do something along the coastal regions, for example, then you need to go to meter scale. And that's a completely different environment. And is your model large scale, small scale, 2D, 3D, um, uh, or some other type of application? So that will also decide for you what kind of compute environment you need. And so message passing now is evolving to uh, also be a, um, the communication um, application space that you'll use to move your data or split your data or do what we call data decomposition. And I'll touch lightly on that today as well. So with that, we'll get started with uh, message passing. We'll talk about just an overview, some of it you've seen. MPI, what is it? Point-to-point -point communication. How do these different MPI resources talk to each other? And then how do they collectively communicate? Um, the decomposition and mapping, how do we break up a big problem into smaller problems that can be done on um, a, a, a collection of nodes? And then a little bit about profiling and tracing and some other complex routines. And, and this will just sort of touch the surface, and I, I promise to try and to, to be done in an hour. Supercomputer architectures, you've seen this slide. So this is a revisit of um, a complicated board with multiple chips on it. And um, that the, the interconnection on these boards is very important, as is the local memory. On the AMD Epic, for example, it's got four quadrants. Each quadrant has multiple CPUs. So they have to have just on the board their own interconnection network and they need to be aware of each other. So balancing and tuning for AMD um, uh, NUMA architecture is tricky and we're doing a, an advanced workshop on that in April to teach people how to optimize for that. Some of my students here from our student cluster competition team got to uh, work with the AMD architecture and do some interesting tuning. And so you know, they have some um, thoughts on that as well. Um, so we need some kind of parallel approach that's scalable and allows us to achieve some improved performance. The classic problem of, hey, I got uh, eight cores and my code worked well, now I've got 10,000. It should work 10,000 times faster, but that's not the case. There's so many factors that affect how well your, your job performs. Did you give each node enough work? So you can over distribute to where maybe communication is 
taking over computation. So you have to balance all that out. So the point is that um, the architectures are interesting and fun, complex, capable of doing a lot of work. But um, as you navigate your way through parallel computing, keep in mind that th th if you get stuck, ask a question because odds are somebody else has had that problem and reach out to the training people at the institutions that you're working with. So there's different topologies and the, the topologies do affect how data is communicated. Here's a hypercube. So, so these, let's see, where's my pointer? These two nodes are near each other. So they can communicate pretty quickly at the speed of light or electrons in the, the copper wires. But this node here and this node way back there, they might have an extremely long path. So they come up with all of these network topologies to minimize and balance out the communication latency so that on average, the time for data to go from this node to the furthest node is on average the same as the time for data to go from this node to this node so that computations are well balanced. Expanse is architected to try and fit problems onto one of their compute racks so that all the nodes on that compute rack, they all have about the same communication time. And if you can keep your job on one compute rack, then your job might scale nicely. It's not designed for petascale computing. You want to go to Oak Ridge or some other um, system which is designed for moving petabytes of data and um, needing lar large memory and, and a lot of cores. Uh, Expanse is designed again for that long tail of science. So the average jobs are smaller, but we have a lot more of them. Okay, so you can have uh, tree-shaped network connections and we worry about the bandwidth, how fast is my data moving and the size and the bisection bandwidth. How long does it take for you to communicate between these different topologies? This is if I was ever gonna be an engineer, I would go into networking topology. It's really interesting. Um, that's how things get communicated out in the commercial world as well. Um, all of the signals that we're looking at and the messages appearing in your browser, they're going through some complex networking topology, which has backups in case things um, crash. Um, and just the HTTP, the web networking itself is interesting. All right, so for parallel computing, we have, we have to uh, execute instructions and we want to do them concurrently on these physical resources. Um, and if you, you, some of them are tightly coupled like the cores and some could be loosely coupled like the nodes that have a lot of cores. And we, we worry about uh, making sure the instructions get computed correctly and concurrently so that if you have 10 nodes doing some work and node number six has got like too much work, then, then it will slow everybody else down if they all have to compute some value like the temperature on a slab of metal at, and finish their com computations and, and share data. And if one of the nodes gets really slowed down, then something's imbalanced. And so we, part of parallel computing is distributing your problem um, evenly and uh, so everything is somewhat concurrent. And so um, for high performance computing, some of the benefits are the large capacity on these machines, the large number of compute nodes. Um, and so the memory and the storage is really important. And in the data generation that we're in, that's even more important. Um, and then uh, we wanna get performance, more floating point operations per second for not only the hardware designed by the manufacturer, that's important, but what you really care about is you don't care so much about that. You care how your code is, is performing. Did you port it to a high performance computer? And are you now getting things, um, your calculations done in eight hours instead of one month? So we parallelized our ocean model, my PhD project. And we did get, we started using a library called Petsy, uh, took two to three years, but we did reduce run times from roughly a month to roughly um, a few hours. And so that's the kind of impact you can get and it's important to be able to realize, oh, I need this, it's worth the effort. And of course there's cost in not only financial, but complexity, um, how to coordinate these tasks and, and how to do that optimally. Um, it's really um, important to have, a, have an idea of what's going on on the computer, what's the hardware like. So as you try to debug your program, 
you um, you can start to think about the many, many layers of software and hardware that are between you and your um, problem being answered. So there's um, different ways to de describe computer architectures and for high performance computing, we have something called Flynn's taxonomy. And it really has to do with what's happening with the work being done, the instructions and the data being moved around. So we could have one instruction working on one piece of data and that's single instruction, single data, SISD. We can then have um, a single instruction, like all of the um, programming units are going to do addition, and um, it's going to work on the data, and, and all of the instructions will be the same. We can also have um, multiple instructions and multiple data. Some of these units will add, some might um, uh, subtract, or they might add and then subtract. It depends on how you've architected it. And then there's multiple instructions and multiple data. We used to be mostly in the single instruction, multiple data, kind of like vector pipelines. But these days, most of the top 500 systems are multiple instruction and multiple data. Um, so the execution models, there's, um, we think about where's the data. Uh, and, and is it shared or is it um, distributed? Because if you have shared memory, then for example, all the cores on your node have some shared memory that there's a certain cost to moving data in and out of that local shared memory. But you're gonna get much better performance if you can stay in that model uh, than having to communicate and share data in a distributed manner to go off node, for example. And so, uh, people who look at um, HPC systems, they worry about all the levels of cache. We won't go into that today, but if you look at a, a CPU unit, it's got local cache and then it's got some, um, a little bit larger cache, a little bit farther away and all the communication time required to load messages in and out that get pipelined in, um, they cost time. And so you try and stay on that note if you can, but if you can't, then you have to pay the communication cost. But it's um, still good and you still get acceleration because if you try to do all your work on the one node, you might not have enough memory. So then you're still trying to move data in and out to that one node. And then execution models, we can have different kinds of parallelism thread level. Um, you're using thread level parallelism on your laptop right now. Most of you are, you're running Zoom, you're listening to me, you're, you got your message, your mail client open, you got some browsers, maybe you got a Word document, you're trying to edit something and follow what I'm saying, or you just have a whole bunch of windows like, like me. I have 15 Chrome uh, windows uh, on my dock on my OS, and each of those probably has eight or 10, you know, lots of research. Those are all threads. So you guys do thread parallelism all the time. We have um, OpenMP, which you learned about last week, and GPU threads, which you've been learning about. And that's a different kind of parallelism with the focus on high performance computing and coordinated computation. I would say all the applications running on your laptop are not coordinated in the sense of all the Chrome browsers trying to print a page out at the same time. They're asynchronous. And um, a lot of the thread parallelism we work with in HPC is synchronized uh, where possible, but um, synchronized periodically during the computation. Most of our applications, if they aren't, then we call them embarrassingly parallel. But you know, stock market calculations for updating trade, trades, uh, trade activity for the day, those are kind of asynchronous. But generally, a lot of high performance scientific computing is, um, has some synchronization in it. And so then we get this parallelism by decomposing the work. We can either break it up into different tasks and have those go off and work asynchronously, or uh, we decompose the uh, matrix and map it on to different processors to look at fluid flow in a room or you know, airflow or fluid flow. Um, and then some of the tasks can have dependencies. So if I'm trying to calculate hot air moving through a room and I break it up into a bunch of little cells, each cell has to know 
what heat am I getting from my neighbor? And I have to give some heat to my neighbor because uh, particles are moving through. So that, that's the communication um, model where there's a lot of dependency. All right, so um, getting, that's a sort of our overview, kind of like big view of MPI. Um, and then um, the, the, the training material will be uh, in week six of our repo. I just updated it about 10 minutes before the talk. And so make sure before you try and do the exercises that you do a, a fresh update. And it also has my talk, which I, I'll, I'll update, but there is a, a, a copy I uploaded this morning for the talk. And then um, Lawrence Livermore has been teaching MPI and doing other tutorials for a long time. And they have a, uh, a, a page where you could, they have a full tutorial on MPI and other technologies that I can recommend you go look at. But also they have a, a page where you can download all their source code. And so just follow that link. And I'm using some of them, some of them we've changed, but there's just like really basic MPI um, tutorials in there. Okay, so the exercises I'm going to do today are all uploaded into the, the repository. They worked for me. They should work for you. So hopefully I've given you everything you need to get things done. Um, so message passing interface is a um, low level abstraction using um, SPIMD, single program multiple data execution model, plus messages. It's designed for memory that's distributed. It can be distributed between nodes. Like you could have uh, several nodes where you're using a lot of cores and you have one of the control nodes or the primary node, we, we used to call them master slave, but uh, in awareness, um, I never liked that. And then we called that parent child, the parent in charge and the children do all the work. And I never liked that because when you have to turn off a an extra node or core, you have to kill the process. So I hated that. And so now it's like the, the primary and the workers, um, there's different terminology for that. But at some point you have one of your resources is the control node. Um, so primary or control node, and then all the other nodes are doing work um, doled out to them by this control node. And so um, that's what these um, messages also are about is the nodes and cores, they may need to communicate. You know you have to send messages in between the cores, I mean, in between the nodes, but the cores themselves, if you set them up with MPI, they might try to exchange messages with each other, but they don't need to. So optimally, you might do a hybrid MPI open MP deployment on a node. So you wanna think about the messages that you're sending. They're designed for distributed memory, not local shared memory. And so MPI is evolving a bit in that um, sense. Um, and, and so when you do start, that's, that's why we started teaching this class, starting with GPU, adding in MPI, and then MPI on top of that. But all of my examples today are pure MPI, but be aware that if you're on a machine with 128 cores, MPI might try to have communication set up between those cores. So just be aware of that as far as the scaling goes. Um, there's a API specification and you can get information here. Uh, like any other programming um, environment, language application, it's got an application programming interface that you program to. So if you wanna know the details of the arguments to the many functions I'll show you today, is it integer? Is it a double? Is it a floating point? And then what do these other arguments mean? You should find that here for each of the calls. And I have some examples, but you can dig around in here and find more information. There's some um, implement implementations of MPI. There's MVA pitch, Intel MPI, Open MPI, and probably some others out there. These are the ones uh, we work with commonly on our systems here. And they're, they're all gonna follow a standard that's set by the MPI forum. And for people to participate in the MPI forum, usually companies are doing it because they're developing the hardware that MPI will run on it, but they pay, and they pay a fee, usually quite a heavy fee, but they drive the standards that says, if you're gonna do a particular 
communication protocol, it has to follow these exact standards. So everybody knows how to write their libraries and um, how to develop the hardware. With that said, each one of these compilers will have some special customized um, tools they've added to their toolkit to give you an advantage to using them. So if you're looking to only use one, one kind of um, MPI library forever, then use all the fancy tools and add-ons that they have. But realize if you ever have to migrate your code to a different um, programming model or programming library, you may lose some functionality. And it happens, I, it happened to me once I had all these IO routines and went from one machine at um, SDSC and went to a machine at TAC, at HPC. And um, oh, half of my IO routines for saving data, I had to rewrite. So you just wanna be careful. You end up using them and you don't know, but it's a gotcha that can occur. So, you know, code portability is important. Um, these implementations are, are available on um, any system. You just need to know that they've installed it. I'll touch briefly on how we access code and libraries on Expanse, but uh, you, you've already gotten the Expanse 101 introduction where we talked about modules and that's how it's done on modern systems these days. It uh, gives you a power, but you have to know where to find the things that you need or to ask about it. Um, it also has point-to-point -point communication. Each node or core, it can be set up to talk to another specific node or core. So you have granularity down at the microcontrol level, or you can do a global communication where one node or core can talk to all the others and some mixing of that in between. And we'll go through those communication. Um, uh, we'll do an overview of communication and the different data types and these collective operations. And uh, we can have one-sided communication, parallel file IO and other tools to support these activities. So, this slide shows you um, the typical code structure for an MPI. You have to have an include file, just like all languages, Fortran and C, or import a package in Python. You have to have something that knows about MPI. And then um, you might define your variables and start your program. And you're gonna go, when you first fire up an MPI code, it's in serial mode. And what happens, some of the magic is when you launch your job to a, a cluster, let's say you ask for 10 nodes, all 10 nodes will get a copy of this particular code, unless you're doing a decomposition and that's a bit different. But for our simple model, all of the nodes will get the same MPI file. They'll get that same MPI code. And then they'll start out serial and then hit a block of code where MPI gets initialized. I'll show you that code. And that's where the parallel code begins. A bunch of stuff gets done down here. And when you're done with your parallel code, you, you terminate it and you go back to serial code and exit the program. And once you start MPI, the, the most likely the program running on one of the 10 nodes needs to know who am I? And we call that the rank. I'm, I'm out of 10 nodes, I'm ranked zero through nine is typically the numbering. And then um, I need to know how to communicate with all of the processors. If I run a job on Expanse where we have tens of thousands of cores and I'm only asking for 10, which of those 10,000 are mine? Well, each of, the, each of those cores gets some initialization and they're told, well, you're gonna be part of Mary Thomas's MPI code and you're gonna be the fourth, uh, uh, co uh, fourth um, processor uh, out of the 10, and it doesn't matter where that processor is located, but that processor then is told you're part of this world group of 10, 10 um, processors that are gonna do some work on this um, particular code. And then um, th some work might need to get done and the communication between the processes might need to be done, more work, more communication, and you repeat that cycle until finally the work is done. And that's the, the basic global views. <clears throat> you have to realize Expanse is big. It has a lot of cores and nodes and racks. And somewhere in that block of hardware, you're gonna get a few cores to do some work. 
and um, MPI is the coordinating over, over, overarching coordinating software. You don't have to worry about it. It's all taken care of for you. What you need to understand is how your program is mapping onto those cores and how you're using it and are you using it efficiently. So you have initialize MPI init. Um, the, uh, M and you're gonna find out how many tasks or processors, that's the communication size and the order, uh, so that might be 10. And then the rank of the processor that's currently um, running this MPI code. And so that's the rank. So remember all 10 processors will be running up to some point uh, in the serial mode up until initialize MPI, they're all running the same code. And then when they'll run the same code uh, in, within the MPI block, the parallel block in a more coordinated manner. And you have to tell them how you want them to be coordinated. And so we're gonna look at computing Pi. And so we look at Pi using um, an integration under a curve type of um, model. And we're just, this one is hard coded. You're welcome to change the number and see how the accuracy of Pi might change. Obviously the more points you have, the, the more accuracy you'll get. And it just looks at sums in these different sections for the MPI tasks. And at the end, the sums in this example are all gathered together into a final uh, product and that's um, computed to use to compute Pi. And we use something called MPI reduction. And I'll talk about reduction operations a bit later. Okay, so just uh, stopping real quick to point out, MPI has all the data types in C and Fortran and, and Python and several, and Java. You can run Java in parallel. It might not be very efficient, but you can. And so all these data types exist. Make sure when you're defining these, um, what I would call, you know, specialized variables and MPI int 16 underscore T. If you ever have to port this to a, another machine and another compiler implementation, these may or may not be called the same thing. They should by the standard, but the standard is something that almost all of the vendors follow, but it's not 100% guaranteed. So you might find you, you've migrated to a different library from M, OpenMP to um, uh, GNU compiler, or you know, doing, using a different compiler, and all of a sudden your answer is not quite right. So be careful you know what your data types are and you know how they're supported on the different machines. That's just a gotcha, that's part of programming anyway. That happens whether you're in parallel computing or not, but you add on the layer of this being a, a yet another library on top of the default C and Fortran uh, compiler uh, steps, uh, you need to be careful on the data types. Okay, so here's our basic program. Um, I've highlighted in red and yellow our MPI calls. And so here's our MPI we're including. And that will work if you've loaded the right modules. I'll show you what to do next. But if you haven't got the right modules or the right path to the libraries that need to um, give you access to the MPI.h or the paths, then it won't work. So here we're going to define the variables that we need to do a little bit of simple work for computing pi. So MPI init. In this example, they are showing you how to pass values to the code, just like standard C or in Fortran, you would see it. And, but you wanna initialize them as well with MPI init. If you put them in here, then all processors will get those arguments. By default, the argc, argv values are only available to the, the primary node, the control node or core processor. So if you want those on every node, then, um, or every process, then you wanna add those into MPI. If you don't wanna deal with them, you don't even have to put them in the code. I've got both examples in, in um, this week's work. Uh, so then what we do is we call that command to get the communication size, MPI com world, and how many total processors were asked for. Remember each of those nodes that processors that get the code 
they didn't start it, they didn't see the batch script. So everything that they need to know, you need to communicate to them. And these um, commands here help get that information. The MPI COM world is a virtual abstraction. It's a big long integer that represents a value that represents the collection of processors that the SLURM system put together for you to do your job. It's temporary, it's only uh, has this value while the programs are running, um, but it, it's a number that they use to find each other. It's like an address in a neighborhood. So MPI COM world is the street all the houses live on. The rank is the housing number on that street. And so that's also fun to know and sometimes important to debug where is my code running and why am I having a problem? And so if you know how to get the name of the processor, again, make sure that this, um, this or some equivalent is available in any um, implementation you pick. If you need to use it, make sure you can get it. But this way you'll know which host am I on. And so we can get the rank and then the host name. And then we're gonna set up how many intervals we'll have in this decomposition. And then notice we've put up a barrier command here. This is theoretically supposed to halt all 10 of the processes to wait for all their other neighbors uh, to wake up. And it can take some time if you're doing 100,000 cores, for example, that could take a really long time. And so we, we use barriers to force synchronization. Those mostly work. And then you might get a program that's big enough that there can be some troubles, but in general, these barriers work well. And then we print out the, the number of MPI tasks. This little blue green is if rank equals zero. That means if I am the processor that is the control one, I'm gonna print out a message. The other processes don't need to print that out. But down here on this line here, all of the processors begin figuring out um, how many points do that, does it need to work with an initialization for pi local? So when you think about work being done by 10 processors, they all do local work. And then there's information they might share among each other and that would be global information. So getting learning to recognize local, how much work am I doing on my node or my core and, and um, computing my little contribution to pi um, and then we go through all the points and we um, compute a value based on our rank and we sum all these values. And then we have a little estimate for our little chunk of basically area inside that integral. And then what we do is we take a reduction operator and we collect all those values from each one of the uh, um, um, processors. They all share data to um, the, the mass, the um, primary uh, processor. And so then if I'm the primary processor, then I define my value of pi and, and um, I print out the answer. And this becomes the global. So the reduction operator here is um, MPI underscore sum. Reduction operators take all the information from all of the processes and reduce them to some answer based on a mathematical operation. And here we're just adding them all up. So if you look at um, all of the little areas that were computed by the different cores, then you add them all up, you get the total area, and then they use that to get pi. And then we're done, so we exit the code. The, we exit the application. So what do we mean by MPI COM world? Somewhere on, on a big machine like Expanse, I'm going to ask for five um, nodes, OK? And um, I'm going to get these different nodes, and I'm going to have um, different um, cores, processes on each of those nodes. So I'm here I got four, uh, four nodes, and I'm going to have five processes. So I got my, this is, you ask for this in the batch script, and I'll show you how to do that in a moment. But this is just an example of how things are not as uniform as you might like. And physically, these different nodes could be, a, hopefully they're on one rack of expanse, but they could be anywhere, depending on how busy the machine is and when the machine can grab you enough nodes and processes to do your work. All right, so again, these are these functions for 
setting up the environment, MPI init, uh, MPI, and these can be null if you're not going to use them, MPI com size, the rank, and finalize. And when you look at the documentation, you'll see the different values defined in the API. And then in this, um, just to remind you in this application, we got the processor name and we called the reduction operator. I'll talk about that also a little bit more. But in this one, you're going to send um, a buffer of data, receive a buffer of data. There'll be a size for that. You'll get a particular data type uh, and an operation. And um, the root is what's the, the, the primary um, processor in the whole uh, MPI com world environment that's controlling this reduction. And then the actual um, address of that MPI com world. And then there's the code from our application. So let's try and run an example. Um, if we have time, then I'll go ahead and do these live. But all of these are taken from Expanse, obviously, yesterday, where I updated everything. So you want to compile it. Um, and here's the compile command. Uh, and you have to preload your module environment. And I'll show you what those are. It's I, keep, uh, I put them all in the batch script. And so I'm going to run the batch script job. I get back a job ID. By now, this pattern should look familiar to you guys if you're doing some of the work. I run the SQ command to see if my job is still running. Yes, it is. And then it gets done. And what's in it is hello, MPI from task 0 on Expanse. Notice I've got three different nodes. So I asked for um, 15 tasks on three different nodes. And you can see that they all have a different task, task number. That's their rank. And some of them are running on different nodes. So it's distributed across nodes and using multiple cores on the node. And I'm sorry, I don't have um, my slide with the actual um, batch script is not there. But I will show that to you um, when we get uh, down later. I should have another slide in here. OK, so we want to communicate between these different processes <clears throat> these right now didn't send any information, except they did communicate by sending some number back to the reduction operator. And notice we got a pi value here. And I want to point out to you that it's pretty close, but it's not as good as it could be if you know pi and you've memorized it out to 300 decimal places. One of the ways we improve it is by having each task do more work. And the other one is you want to, uh, when you look at the code, check out one little gotcha that most people miss. Um, look at this print station statement. It's printing the pi answer out using a floating point 32-bit uh, format. And if you want more accuracy information, you need to use like a double or some other output format. So a lot of times people think they have the wrong answer without the right, they don't have the accuracy. But it might be associated just with not only the data type, these are doubles. We should be printing using a double format. OK, so point-to-point um, -point communication. We want to send maybe two of these processes need to talk to each other. And so they use um, a send-receive protocol. And MPI supports that very well. And so we'll look at these send operations. You can have different synchronizations. Um, what happens when a send is done or when it's not? And you can, you can control the buffering. You can optimize point-to-point uh, -point communication for large buffers or small. And those require different messaging protocols, as you might imagine, on a network with thousands of nodes and you know, a lot of cores, that the communication and how messages get sent all over that are important. And MPI um, is optimized for that. They've done a lot of work on that. So. You might think about, am I using a large packet bandwidth when all, when all of my messages are actually very tiny? Do I just send a whole bunch of tiny messages, or should I build them up into one longer message and then send um, a long message? That, that's something a little bit more advanced concept, but you should be aware of it. And any send routine can be repaired, paired with a receive routine. Um, and then there's uh, routines to probe the status of these messages and find out what's coming. Um, so 
The way MPI works is there's an application level and then this a communication layer. You really don't need to worry too much about the communication layer. You're programming more at this um, MPI application layer. But again, if you worry about buffer sizes and message sizes, when you do send data, you want to fill that pipe. And once you, it takes some uh, startup time to, to open up that pipe and for that this particular processor to say hello to this other processor. Hey, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can I send you some data? Yes, you can send me some data. Okay, I'm going to send you this much data. Okay, I can take that much data. A lot of communication goes on. That's called the latency. And then you start sending your data. So you want to optimize, minimize latency and optimize communication. And so these get filled up and then the data gets um, transmitted. And sometimes your application, um, if it's waiting for data from another processor, it needs to just wait till the data is all there. In other scenarios, the application could start using the data as soon as it gets there. And that's why part of what you can control with the send receive and the, the uh, collective operations. Okay, so if you send, data somewhere, then some processor has to be there to receive it. So we have MPI send and MPI receive. And you send a buffer of data that's a certain size based on the MPI data type. The number of bits in uh, a message will depend on, is this integer? Is it floating point? Is it double precision? Is it a, an object, a structured object? And then how many of them come then MPI takes those pieces of data and has an idea of how big that buffer is going to be so it can create storage for that um, buffer it's expecting to get. And um, you can have blocking send. This is an example that if I start to send you a message, I'm going to wait until I know you've got it. Okay, and if you and in the programming model, you have to set up uh, a processor that's got to be ready to receive that data because this is called a blocking send. The sending processor will not go any farther until it knows that the, the processor it's sending data to has gotten it. It can send data to more than one processor, but nothing will happen on this particular processor until data is done. It's a synchronized um, send receive. You can go asynchronous as well, but you have to pick that intentionally. And again, we have we can put in a tag so we can have some number on the message being sent. This is the destination processor and the comp communication group. Right now we have the MPI com world. It's all 10 of the processors. You can split the domain up, but we won't get into that very much today. Um, so now I'm a processor and I've gotten to the line in my code where I'm supposed to receive some data. And I'm gonna, I have to have a buffet a buffer allocated for that or a pointer to a buffer and I need to know how big it's going to be the data type to expect. This is um, uh, uh, somewhat loosely defined on the receiver part. The sender doesn't really care what the receiver stores the data in. The sender just cares that the data got there. The receiver can put the data where it needs to. Generally these are the same. Uh, it runs smoother if they are, but they don't have to be. Um, for example, I might send a vector to a, a, device, a processor that's storing things into a matrix. So that's where you might envision some difference. But still, I have to have a buffer big enough for all the data coming or there's an error. And I have to know who it's going to come from. I can have a tag. I might be looking for that tag. And I need the right communication group because we have to be able to talk to each other. And um, then here's a status for, that can tell uh, the receiving process what happened. Did things work well? OK, excuse me. OK, here's an example of blocking said receive code snippet. If I am the primary uh, processor, I'm going to populate a buffer with uh, i times 4. It's just a randomly populate, populated buffer. And then I'm going to send that buffer to uh, my neighbor who's got rank 1. I'm rank 0. 
That's my ID. Uh, you can call this variable whatever you want. Typically they call it rank, but my ID is common. If, I'm, if I am uh, rank zero, if my ID is zero, create the buffer and send it to uh, my neighbor rank one. It, else if, if I am rank one, I'm gonna sit there and wait. Don't do anything, but wait till you get a message, which usually happens pretty quickly, but it could take a while. And then I'm gonna store as a float and uh, populate this um, status um, object. We don't have to look at it, but you could if you want. And then I'm gonna print out the data that I got. That way you can confirm that the point-to-point -point communication between two processors was successful. And then here's a send receive communication example. Um, in this code, um, we set up a message, we initialize the environment, we get um, the name of the identity of the communication world and how big it is. We um, get the rank for this particular uh, process. And again, if I'm, uh, if I'm a worker node, create a message, send the message. It's a character. There's so many characters in it. We have a dimension max string as that's an M. We defined it up here. And then otherwise, I'm going to um, greetings from the primary process. So if I'm not the primary node, then make a message. And if I am, sit there and wait for a message and print it out uh, when it's done. It's a simple, it's a little bit of a hello world. Uh, and here's the batch script. I did promise you a batch script. My templates for the batch scripts are all pretty much the same. I've set you guys all up to use Slurm on a CPU using a, a GCC compiler and the open MPI um, module for the MPI AP libraries. And so uh, pretty much you can take this script and um, this is called MPI send receive dot C. You'll see it in the example code. And um, there we are, uh, this example, three nodes, task per node. You can play with these and you'll get an idea uh, of what um, um, communication. Notice this is between multiple processors. So, um, and there's the output. And here's how you submit the job. Batch MPI send receive SP, you get the job ID. So you'll see this pattern all the way through our examples. Okay, deadlocking. What happens sometimes you get the order of the sends and the receives in, in the wrong order. So here's an example of what we call deadlocking, where one process um, sends off information and can't can't pull drop out until it it knows that that information got um, received. And here, if if I am the primary processor, I'm going to send a buffer and then wait to get a buffer back. If I'm the other processor, I'm going to send my buffer and wait to get a buffer back. But can you see the problem? Both processors are waiting to get data, but this processor needs to get data before it can send. So we've got this programmed backwards, but it does demonstrate to you the, the, um, the blocking, um, um, the default blocking for, for these um, routines. What we can do as a simple fix is if I'm the primary send and wait for my data, if I'm not wait for data, then send my results. That's pretty straightforward. We have the, the non-blocking code um, in the repository and I, I've set you up with a, a batch script and keep it at, when it does deadlock, you won't get anything and your code won't finish very quickly. And I've got some minimum time sent, set for like two minutes. Just don't touch that and let it run and watch and wait and you'll see the answer, the results coming up. Uh, but it does take a while because it has to use up all the time that you put in the batch script. So be careful with this one. Um, so the non-blocking MPI send and receive routines, there are non-blocking send and re receive routines. There are times when you just want to send off the data and let your code go on and do its work. And that's okay. And then at some point in the routine, 
you might asynchronously let your know your 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 processes do their work, and then at some point you have a barrier where you sync everybody back up because maybe some of the processes will have more or less data and more or less work, and you can't predict that. And so you use the non-blocking um, send receive. So um, an example here is a ring topology. So communication is important and you test communication between your different nodes um, using this uh, example here where we're trying to send data. And in a ring topology for this example, we have eight processes and um, each process talks to its neighbor and also gets native, native data from its neighbor. And so we start out with a MPI asynchronous send and a MPI asynchronous um, receive and send. And it doesn't matter, they can start and stop when they want because the, the communication between processor six, it's gonna send data to seven and it's gonna wait for data from five. And there's no other synchronization required in this simple topology. So here we start the code, get the MPI environment going, and um, we just go ahead and do send and receive and then wait. And uh, sure enough, here's the batch code uh, where we're gonna use eight nodes and just four minutes, it's all we need. Make sure you're using a valid um, account. And then I set up the environment. Notice in this one, you can put more than one module load on a line. And uh, here's my MPI run command. Uh, compile it is straightforward. Um, MPI CC O ring topo, and then submit the job. And here's our output. So here's the different task numbers that communicated with their neighbors. So here you see task four communicated with three and five. Task four communicates with three and five. I didn't print out much more information than that, than that, but you could have said task four got this value from three and sent this value to five or, or vice versa, depending on how you wrote the code. But the idea is that this is also introducing a, a new concept to you, which is how are my processors ordered? By default, they're ordered in a vector linear relationship. And um, the ring is just a conceptual of how they communicate, but they're numerically ordered by default. They have no physical mapping to perhaps the problem space you're trying to work on. So you have to be aware of how am I setting my processors to communicate and do they need to? And if so, how does it map? And I'll, I'll show you a couple of examples on that. So collective routines. Right now we had just one, one point to point communication between a group, a small group of processors sending data. But when we did the all reduce, that was a reduction operation. And that's what we call a collective routine where all the nodes, all the processes are involved in the, the communication at some level. And so, or most of them are. Um, and so you want all the processes in a group or communicator, communicator to wait till they get synchronized. That's that MPI com world. And you can move data uh, by sending and receiving data with a broadcast, a gather, a scatter, all to all. You can have collective computations, which we call reductions. That's what we had for the pi calculation. And so you can have these operations. There's a lot of them. Um, min, max, add, multiply, divide on that data obtained. And you can share the result or not. Um, and you can uh, do some hybrid version. So right now, our, our, our simple code had the barrier and then we printed out the number of MPI tasks. And so that was a small synchronization example. We told all the core, all the processors that are part of MPI com world, you guys are together, wait until everybody's reached this point in the code. And then if you're the primary rank, print this information out. I mean, remember, this is a barrier for the, the startup process that um, if you had a large number of processes, like thousands of them, they can take a while. And if you had a lot of data, at one point, my parallel ocean model um, took like seven or eight minutes to fire up when we were running um, the large number of uh, a, a very high uh, granular data set on a few thousand cores. 
It took seven or eight minutes. It's very boring. All right, all the tasks will wait, wait till they're synchronized. So if you think you're building a big program, put in a barrier to make sure everybody's at, all the processes are where they need to be. So graphically, collectives are broadcast. One of your processes will send data to all of the other processes and they all get the same value. Um, this is what happens basically when you add the argc, argv to the MPI init um, routine when you uh, start up your C code. The MPI init will broadcast argc, argv to all of the nodes. For example, do they all need to know the name of something? Do they all need to know the dimensions of a matrix that they're going to be um, working on? So there's information that you may give need to give to all of the um, other processors. Scatter is um, one of the processes, sends particular subchunks of data to each of the other processors, data decomposition. And then gather is the reverse of scatter. And then uh, reduction is what we did before. In this one, this is a reduction, taking a value from each of the processors and getting a sum or an answer. And there's an advantage to using that because um, the MPI API, the libraries optimize for these operations. You can do them manually, but when you use the collective operation or if you use anything that's part of the API, you get optimized code. Um, here is an example for the broadcast. Uh, we build a buffer, then we're gonna send that buffer uh, to everybody. And then um, they all get that input data. Now, if you had a really large data set, and you're reading that data in from a, a file, you probably don't want to send all of the data to all of the nodes. You probably want to do um, an operation where they each get their chunk of data. Uh, and here's how you compile this broadcast.f90. It's in your examples. And there's a batch script. Um, here's broadcast where we initialize. We build up a buffer, and then we send everybody the buffer. And here I had uh, um, 13, 14, 15 um, uh, processes, and they all got the same data. Now, I want to point out something to you. Notice how the order of these processors is not numerically sorted. That's because the way in which the processors do their work, do their work is by default asynchronous. And, and so the output, the order in which a particular processor gets done is not guaranteed to be exactly at the same time. It's non-deterministic because first of all, they have to get in some pipe before they can print test standard out. That's a pipe and they have to get in line. So you're gonna see things in what we call asynchronous, non-deterministic order. If you need your results sorted, you need to add in some logic after the code's done running and it's out of the parallel model for you to sort your data and get it in some order. So you get used to that pattern. You're not doing anything wrong. You're gonna see that all the time. Reduction, we talked about that in our PI code. Um, this one is from a different example called factorial, where we're each, having each of the um, cores do some sub chunk of work in the factorial and we multiply the data and bring it back to the, the root process uh, and uh, print out the factorial value. And, and so um, you could take a look at factorial. Again, it's in your examples. The MPI reduce for addition. I wanted to show you this. If you're in computer science or mathematics, you understand binary tree structure. And the reduction operation, I could write manual code that goes for i equals one to eight or i equals zero to seven. Take the value and add to get send a, send a message to my neighbor, get their value, send a message to my next neighbor and add up all the values. And that's gonna require seven operations, but more importantly, seven time steps to get to the answer. But what we do for a tree structured operation is they have pairs of nodes in this example, pairs of nodes work on an addition operation together they come up with an interim. So this is one time step. And then these nodes pair up and they come up with an interim result. That's the second time step. 
And then the final result are these two nodes are sent to the root node. So instead of seven time seconds, time steps are, you know, seven seconds, I only need three time steps. And so that's three seconds. And that gets you some parallelism. I've already cut my work done down the time to solution by more than a factor of two. Okay, and so behind all of these collective operations is this kind of logic. There's different implementations, but basically that's what's happening with um, a lot of these operations. Uh, compiling and running the reduction factorial example. Here's our reduction operator here. And uh, here's the answer for eight factorial. And I included factorial serial so you can see that indeed we got the right answer. And you can play with the, uh, this one goes by the number of cores. So uh, the, if you increase the number of cores, you'd be getting uh, 15 factorial, for example. Okay, have fun with that one. All reduce. Um, this example here is um, uh, um, a global. Um, all of the nodes will get the reduction um, answer. So we're going to look for a value on all of the processes and figure out which one which of the processes has the maximum value, and then all the processes will get that answer. And that will get um, IMAX local is the value on the processor, and IMAX is really IMAX global. Remember that local global concept. And so um, in the all reduce a butterfly pattern, you can see we looked at this already. So all of the nodes gave their values to the root process. We got the final answer. And then using a reverse butterfly pattern in three time steps, all of the processes got the, that answer for the global IMAX. And you'll use this a lot for like um, PDEs and any, any iterative process where you have to come to some solution and a minimization. Uh, so you would be using MPI all reduce. And here's the code um, for uh, the factorial. Um, or just for my ID. And then they um, do a product uh, and you get this answer I factorial and all of the cores know about I factorial. Okay, reduction operations, there's quite a few. You have a max, min, sum, product, um, land and band, lore. So these are um, uh, logical and uh, or, uh, so we have those operations, you can look for maximums and minimums. Data decomposition. So we're, we're getting to the wrap up point, so bear with me. Um, data decomposition. So what kind of problem do you have, right? You have to understand your problem and um, you have to understand how you wanna decompose your problem to work being done on each of these um, different processes. If I have a 10 bags of money that I picked up from coin machines all over the world, all over the, the city. And I have 10 processors and I give you each a bag of money and I don't, I don't know what's in it. I just know it's gonna be coins and bills up to $100 bills. And I say, add up your money and also tell me how much of each type you've got. Depending on what you guys have are given, you're gonna get a different sum. And um, that's just like a random embarrassingly parallel bag of tasks. You can all get that work done. And then through some data reduction, we can get the total number of $1 bills, $5 bills, $10 bills, blah, blah, blah. All right, another way of decomposing the data is if you imagine you're sitting in a room right now and you turn on the heater and there's a vent in the upper left corner of your room and you start feeling some heat coming, um, how do you know when the whole room is heated? This is computational fluid dynamics. So you break the room into little cells. If you had a lot of memory, you would break them up into little tiny one inch by one inch cells and watch particles flow through and some come in hot and then you might transfer some heat to your 3D neighbors. These cells have neighbors above, below, in front of, behind, right, left. Or you might have so little memory that you have to use like one foot by one foot by one foot boxes. So that one's gonna finish faster, but it might not be very accurate. And so how do I decompose that 3D world into that linear array of processors that I've gotten? That's a whole nother class just about. I mean, it's a lot of 
of um, concepts in there, but we'll start talking about that a little bit today. So mapping, um, that's decomposing the work. I'm going to take my 3D room, break it into little boxes, and watch particles flow through and get an idea of the speed and temperature and the, the density of the particles in my particular box. Um, and then mapping it. How do I map that work onto these processes so that it's efficient and makes sense and it maps to my code? And then um, what kind of system am I on? What's my domain and my data? And how do I exchange messages between the different boxes in my room? If I broke my room up into 100,000 little boxes and each box was computing just one each, each process did just one box, that might not be enough work to keep me busy while I wait for 100,000 cores to finish. So I might really only need 1,000 cores and each core gets 1,000 boxes. You, and that's data distribution, data decomposition, and mapping of the problem. And then how do I tell one of my group of boxes to send data and, and where to know? That's all data decomposition. And so we'll look at that. And if you if you don't balance the load properly, you might have a huge load imbalance. Like uh, some processors just never finish because they have so much work, and other processors sit idle. And and that's part of tuning and optimizing your code. So when we first get uh, some processors, uh, we have uh, let's just imagine we have a one D vector. I think uh, to be able to do parallel computing, you really need to know what a vector is and what a matrix is and how to operate on them and have some understanding of that notation. My experience teaching tells me that you really, really need that. I think most um, undergraduates have that by the time they're at this level, but if not, go back and start reviewing matrices because this won't make that much sense in the long run and it's worth some effort getting a little bit of linear algebra. But here we have a, a vector. We have an array uh, with variables in it, and the value in them represents their position in the array. And this is so, um, the first element is one, the second element is two. And I'm going to set up a system where I'm asking for four processors. And so I have to divide my data. I just want to distribute my data so each processor has the same amount. And I do that by giving them a subchunk of the global array. And the global array is 20 elements long, but on my processor, they're each going to be five elements long. And you can see um, the local processors on the second row here, they each have their own local array. That's five elements long, but they're getting data from the master, the, the, the main array, they're each getting their chunk of data and it's not the same. Processor element um, two, is um, getting array elements 11 through 15. And that's a data distribution pattern. It's linear, it's a 1D vector. You kind of get the idea that processing element one will communicate with processing element zero and processing element two if we were doing something where it made sense like the um, kinetics of a, one, a spring moving across the table right? The, the right and left sides of the springs are going to talk that. That's an example of a physical problem. On the other hand, this, there could be a need for this processor one to talk to processor three. It depends on your application. But by default, the processors are numbered numeric in, in a sequential order, and a, as is a, a 1D data array. Ideally, the arrangement of your processors, processors and your data set and your problem, they map that way. If they don't, there are solutions and they're really fun, but they're outside the scope of today's lecture, but I'll show you something about that. So you have to be concerned about how that global problem maps and you have to start developing the concept of a virtual topology because what's hidden from you is these four processors, they might, might be 20 feet away from each other on expanse or on some other system. They might be on the same rack. They might be on the same node, right? They might be four cores on one of the nodes right next to each other, but they could be on four distinctly different nodes that are tens, tens, of, tens of feet away or a few feet away. You don't really know. It might not matter if you get um, the communication performance that you need. 
that where they physically are doesn't really matter. But conceptually, the moment you get your processors in that MPI-COM world group, you have this linear, right? This is a linear arrangement of your processors, excuse me, down here. And then you're going to, in this example, we're going to linearly distribute our array of data. Data distribution is the key to most of the work you're going to do. Data decomposition as opposed to task decomposition. When I gave you each a bag of money, that was really kind of a task decomposition. Okay, so this is a simple application is a 1D heat equation. Excuse me, we all know about heat, but this is a simple way to demonstrate to you why we need to decompose the data problem and then also how do we share data. Once these different processing elements have operated on their data, how do they tell the other processors um, what the results are? And more importantly, why would they? And so this is an example of processor zero. We have processor one and processor two, and they represent points along a straight line. And we're going to look at how heat propagates with heat coming in from the left-hand side along this straight line. Okay, and so these are basically your, um, equa your PDE equations. You have T is the temperature at zero, and we have T at some time later, or the temperature, uh, yeah. And then um, we're looking at a derivative change of the temperature with respect to time. T of X zero is known as an initial condition. We might set all of these initial points to be zero degrees C or 50 degrees Fahrenheit. That's up to the initial condition. And then you're gonna either pumping in heat or taking heat out by pumping cold in. And then this, um, if this is our equation, then um, to do it numerically, we have to discretize it. This is an analog um, equation. And so what we do is we have dt, the change in temperature with respect to time is t at time step n plus one, minus t at time step n, where n is the, the time number, the time step number that we in. we're in. We might run this for 100 time steps every second, for example. That's kind of comes in this, this little term called alpha, uh, you know, how time is related and what's happening and what the coefficient of heat is for this problem. Don't worry too much about that. We're just gonna go through some time steps and the impact of the heat uh, is determined by the time steps and um, the spacing between the points and this alpha heat input influx coefficient. Okay, central difference. That's what this equation basically is. So the heat at, or the temperature at point two is dependent on its current temperature and the temperature to its neighbor next to it and the temperature of the neighbor to its right. So that, and we take a central difference and get a new average for that point at point two, and we iteratively move through every point along this um, dimension. And we are doing 11 points and distributing it over three processes. And there is this concept of uh, ghost or halo cells. And, and these are the two cells that processor zero and processor one, they both share the physical points three and four, but processor zero will update point three and needs to get that new value over to processor one through communication. Processor one will update processor four, element four, and that value at the end of the computation needs to be sent down to processor zero. So they're coupled. Um, and so we have to distribute data so that each processor has its data it's gonna work on, four or five and six, for example, on processor one, and then the neighbor data that it needs to finish its computation on these points. Imagine this is a thousand points and there's a lot more points on each processor. Okay, so a little more detail here. Processor zero, one, and two um, each have their own local data index and then the global data index. Numbers, the points, whoops, the points zero through 10, those are the global data index. But each of these has um, their uh, five points, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Processor 1 has its local data index, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. But the global data index is 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And so you can see that pattern then for processor 3. 
process, the data exchange for each of these processors is processor zero needs to get element four and send element three. So it gets four from processor one and sends the value of data point three to processor one. And then um, processor one has to get data from processor zero and get data from processor two. It has to get um, data point three and data point seven. And it has to send data point four to processor zero and send six to processor two. So it's got double exchange. It's doing more work in the communication regime. And then similarly for processor two, it needs to get um, uh, processor uh, the data element six from processor one and send the value of data point seven to processor one. Sometimes you might need to communicate from zero to 10, depending on the um, kind of problem you're setting up and the boundary conditions. We won't go into that too much. So here's the code for the heat equation. Here's our global and local, and also a little bit of, um, these variables are not necessarily used in this instance. Here's our data distribution, the um, space between each, uh, point is 0.1 D, whatever D is, let's say they're centimeters. Right now we're not worried about that in this simple model. And then um, the time step, uh, this is a, a millisecond, you know, 0.4 milliseconds. So uh, it's double precision, both of these. And then um, the alpha value just is two, whatever that means in the heat equation world. And now we set up our MPI environment and then um, if the number of nodes aren't three, fail because it only needs, it only works on three tasks. This is not a very smart code, but it works for this simple example. Um, and you, you can imagine that if you wanted to be able to increase the number of points and increase the number of cores, you would program more intelligence in. Okay, so here's some of the initial conditions. Uh, and then we um, each, at this point we're in parallel, so each, node process will um, initialize its um, local values, the local, the global, and its temperature. Uh, and then uh, write, um, I've finished setting up my initial conditions. And then we go to the iterations. So we're gonna have three iterations. Often a PDE equation will go for hundreds of thousands of iterations. And so the iterations go from this line here do I time all the way down to this end do at the end. But notice there's a lot of um, sends and receives in this um, group. And um, so you have particular course sending some data, sending and receiving. And so if, uh, if you're the processor zero, you'll be sending and then you're gonna receive something. And then you're also gonna send, um, um, if your processor um, one, you're gonna send some data and, um, and then wait for some data. And so there's send and receives between all of these processors. And then at the end, we print out the answer. So each of the processors have sent their data and then they, they, um, print, they write out their uh, data for what's on their node in their elements. Often when you have a big PDE problem, you do break up the output files so they don't get big too fast. Uh, compilation is normal. We, I'm using the MPI fort command. It's like MPI F90, but it's emerging as the new standard. And then um, run job, this is not correct. It's just S batch and the name. You don't have to do this here. Uh, so now we're running it and here's our output that the processors have started and finished their communication. They're sending and receiving data and then um, solution sent to file. And here's our files. It goes, the output is in data 0.dat, data 1, data 2. I've highlighted um, the processor 0 shares points 3 and 4 with processor 1, which are points 0 and 1 but notice they're the same, same value. And similarly, processor one shares its points three and four with processor two and point zero and one, and they're identical. 
And so your halo ghost cells are correct. So you, you know your computation communication at least is exact and correct. Hopefully your answer is correct as well. Okay, so a couple more comments about data distribution. Um, 2D matrix onto 4D PEs. So what do we do when we're not just in a linear uh, matrix, a linear vector situation? We actually have dimensionality, like we want to look at the 2D heat equation as heat flows along a surface. Now I have a matrix up here with um, a four by four matrix, and I can distribute my data in many, many ways. In this example, I have four PEs, and I'm going to distribute each column to the four PEs. I could do it by row as well. It all depends on how I set up my, my system. And each of the PEs then will have its column of data from the matrix A. I could also do it in chunks. And chunks is an official word. Um, so here I'm going to do two PEs and give each PE two columns. Your code logic will be able to handle it because you know you're working with a 2D matrix and, and you've got a 2D PDE equation that will work on its sub chunk of data. Your communication gets a little more complicated, which um, which is why we won't, we'll, we'll go, you'd have to go into a different class to learn about that. But more, more relevantly is what if this matrix is representing the fluid flow across that surface or the heat equation, and I want to get a little more information exchanged between my, my cores and my node, I would want to do perhaps a 2D or for the you know, temperature flowing, you know, flowing through a room, I really need 3D communication. So how do we do that? What we do is um, we do like a, this is a checkerboard example. Um, let's say I have a surface area where I've got heating elements in four spots. I might want to make, break my matrix up into four sub matrices and let the, the elements communicate with, with each other. Or I just want to do 2D communication so I have more accuracy of how the heat is um, flowing across the surface. And so we use something called Cartesian mapping. And what you do is each, each element now, you, virtual, you have a virtual topology mapping your processors to areas of your problem. Processor 0, 1, 2, and 3. Let's say the heat is coming in somewhere from the left or from a left corner, and I'm heating up this surface. And then these represent the four quadrants on my uh, surface. The more processors I would have, the more sub chunks I would have. And they each get a subset of the uh, matri matrix, the 2D matrix. And then what you do is you set up communication so that processor zero knows it's got neighbors. It's got neighbors on the right and on the bottom. If I want to make this top and this bottom, Sometimes people call left, right, top, down, high, low. You, you have to come up with the terminology, but um, you could even have um, diagonal communication. That's all how you want to set up your code. Uh, the way we've got it, we would be doing simple send receives to add a little more data between the um, data points that we've got. But what you're going to have is a, a mesh of data points on that, um, the subarray on that processor. So you have to modify your code to uh, operate on subarrays like matrix, matrix multiplication or matrix vector, for example, if you have to be doing something like that. And then each of the processor has to do the exchange with the neighbors that it needs to. Okay, so that's data decomposition. And then finally, you wanna be able to profile your code. There's GNU G profile. There's um, tau and systems, um, larger systems that, again, we, we will be going into some of that when Bob Sinkovitz speaks. But there is a feature you can put into your code. Um, Bob Sinkovitz gave a talk on single processor optimization as a webinar, so you can find that. But here's some code you can put into your routine. Well, I'll talk to you in a minute. OK, so um, the library I want you to learn about is MPIP. And so it's a profiling your code. And these are a part of the MPI API. And uh, Mahir and I, we verified that it works um, today. 
And so we've got the code and what you can do is profile in time what's happening inside your code, but do it at the MPI level. GProf will do it at the system level, but these uh, routines will tell you what's happening with MPI so you can look at your communication and, and see, look, this whole group of nodes, they're all communicating 10 times as much as this other group of processors, for example. Uh, so you can take a look at how your code is balanced. Okay, so um, there is the batch script. Uh, looks the same, right? I'm, this one example is going to work with three nodes. It's the heat equation. And here's your module environment and your command to run it. It compiles the same way. And uh, here's the output files. I'll go through more. But it does tell you what happened with these calls and uh, where the communication peaks are. And um, um, I'll show you some live data in a moment. And then finally, um, there's a challenge to do a matrix vector multiplication. And uh, you can find examples of code out there a lot. And now you have a little more idea of how to decompose your problem, perhaps, and um, see if you can show some parallel speed up and efficiency on that. And so if you don't know a lot about matrix vector multiplication, you have an array and a vector, and, and the reduction gets you down to a vector with this uh, uh, result. And you can manually, you can find uh, serial matrix vector multiplication examples out there. And I suggest you get one. So as you practice and try parallel examples out there, you know if you're getting the right answer. And there are parallel examples out there. You're welcome to try and play with one of them and kind of learn a lot about um, uh, the different um, solutions for matrix matrix or matrix vector. Don't try matrix matrix. That's really complicated and it can be very slow. Okay, um, I think that's it for now. I can give you some examples or answer questions. Anybody have any questions? It was a lot of material. Um, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, hi. So. Um... Uh, I was uh, wondering if any if there's any like wrapping program or like uh, something that handles the data decomposition automatically. There is no data decomposition program that handles it. Well, you asked about graphing or data decomposition or both. Um, I think decomposition. Like, say, I'm solving the Navier-Stokes equation in a two D um, plane. I want to like want the program to like sort of decompose that and give me like a set of uh, you know the, the thing that you did manually just now. Is, is there a way to like automate um, that? There are some that kind of do that. Um, PETC, P E S T C, is a a, a large um, program and they do some of that for you. You still have to define some basic aspects and features, but uh, Petsy, we migrated our, our fluid model to Petsy, um, and it took about three years. So it's very complicated, very powerful, but um, it worked. It, it works really, really, really well for the fluid dynamics. So you might want to look at Navier-Stokes type app. It's a Navier-Stokes application. So you might want to start learning Petsy now. This is like a PhD project or master's or... Uh, something you'll be doing for a long time, um, then you might get into the guts of Petsy. Otherwise, mm -hmm. there are some others. Trolinos, I think, is one. I'm not. A, I'm not an expert on that. Um, so you could. Um, you could. Um, I would maybe send if you're working on Expanse. You might ask the sysadmin, the, the user services people for uh, recommendations for your particular application. Good question. Thanks. That's okay. Yeah. Could I ask a question on the <clears throat> partial differential equation that uh, the numerical process that you were talking about? Mm -hmm. Now, how, how, do you, uh, how does that method or procedure accounts for the boundary conditions? 
<laughs> if you fix the boundary conditions, maybe you started swapping all these uh, subunits. Uh, uh, how are you going to approach? And yeah. The also, the problem of uh, these things uh, may have uh, may not get to the fixed point. There's the problem with the fixed point theorem also. Yeah, they might not come to a solution. That's why it only does three iterations. So without going into <laughs> numerical methods and stuff like that, there's this is partial differential equations and you know, yeah. discrete math and, and yeah. PD, numerical PDEs. There's, you know, you can spend your lifetime working on the right delta T, delta X for a particular application, but the boundary conditions for uh, for these, there, there, there are ways to apply the boundary conditions in your model. And if you're, if you're, if you're writing a code, um, I can try and go back to this and see if I can ex demonstrate. Um, okay, I'll share for a moment. I mean, that's that's the root that you've done this kind of code in serial before, so you know the guts of any numerical method is how are you sending and receiving? How are you how are you communicating information in your model? So you might inside this code ask, if I'm on a boundary edge, am I Dirichlet conditions or some other? And so your numerical model would probably account for that. But you would have to know not only am I my ID equals zero, it might be if my ID equals zero, I'm that leftmost boundary and they want to apply, you know, Dirichlet boundary conditions or something, then um, apply, uh, send some information to the other boundary. And am I going to do it in the uh, 3D model, up, down, left, right? So the nested if conditions for where this processor um, is located and which neighbors it needs to communicate with, it's complicated. I'll admit that. And that's why learning a library like Petsy or other libraries is, is good. Unfortunately, I don't have a list for them, but you can go, I would, you can, you can, you'll have to research the particular libraries. And we do have um, experts at SDSC can, that can help with that. Uh, can, can you put up the last slide? Uh, is that this one? the references? Yeah. The last slide, you have the re references. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, can, uh, can can I find something there? Yeah, these references. Uh, no, they, no, no. Um, I think I didn't include anything like that. So send me an email or send it to the group to okay. ask for uh, references for uh, figuring out the numerical method for your problem. That's, um, you know, there's people who devote their whole lives to it. We do have at um, SDSC is part of the Exceed program, uh -huh. the um, ECSS project, which is the um, Exceed Scalable uh, Compute Services. What they do is they work with you on your application. They get paid to help you migrate or port or optimize your application. Oh, and Bob Sinkovitz, <laughs> he's Bob Sinkovitz is probably a person we could connect you with directly, and he can answer questions if you know what your your model is right now yeah, yeah. but that's you know do you want to use um do you want to use petsy or trillin trillinos there's my gosh there's as many libraries out there as there are boundary condition differences so it's going to depend on your numerical method okay. like for the quantum computing stuff i i really don't know yeah, but it's definitely you. i wouldn't let that hold you up at the start uh, -huh. uh it because it'll take a while to develop the right model yeah um but but there are toolkits that help it's just that like i said i i watched a graduate student who came onto our fluid model the ocean model after me migrate everything i i spent a couple of years writing my own 3d uh communication model and it was working but it wasn't very um, scalable um, to the size of matrices that we needed to do. And it was just like other people have teams of 50 people writing these libraries. So, <laughs> so we, we chose Petsy and um, like I said, it did take three years. Uh, 
Yeah. But it's a beautiful now, and the model has um, built-in performance metrics and things like that. But the learning curve is steep. Yeah, sounds very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Um, let's see if I can. I think I had down here for. Oh, here we go. <coughs> This was the data communication model for my 3D uh, curvilinear ocean model. So I'm on one of the processors and it had to communicate with 27 processes. So when we got to that point of the model, I, you know, I was happy that we, we found somebody else who's already building that under, underlying optimized communication mechanisms. And so most real models do 3D. And um, ocean models typically are 2D curvilinear and 3D, they just do an average value, but our ocean model was 3D. So I had communication in all three directions between every processor in the system. So it was, it was complicated. Um, so yeah, we can, we can work with people who end up devol developing models that might need um, something, something more advanced than hand-coded. But again, you know, it depends on your numerical methods and things like that. Any other questions? No, we we end um, in a timely manner. I guess, Joey, we're done recording. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you.